Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Bob. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to our service. It's good to have you. I have the privilege of opening the word this morning and starting our new series. Title of our new series for the fall is called Drift. And uh, some of you are instantly thinking about video games and cars. It's not anything to do with that. So get that out of your head. Uh, As you can see, we've got some images on the water here. And uh, some of my experiences, I remember when we went to the ocean and uh, they talked about the undertow and you walk down and you go swimming and you could feel it when the water crashes in and pulls you back out. Anybody been there, had that experience? And uh, they tell you about it and it's pretty easy to understand and it's pretty easy to see. Probably a little more subtle is going fishing with Chris and uh, trying to find the spot that we caught fish in last time. And, uh, you know, if it's not entered into the digital device, it's hard to find. You're kind of looking at land and referencing something over there. But have you ever been in that case where you've just kind of had a snooze on the boat or been a little inattentive and when you wake up, you're, you're not where you were when you went to sleep? or when you stop paying attention. Well, drift is a very, very real thing. For some of you, you won't identify with those, so let's try this one. Uh, I don't have a car fancy enough, but I did rent a car that had something called lane departure assist. Anybody had experience with that? And you wonder what's wrong with your car when the steering wheel shakes, and the little coffee symbol comes up, and it's because you're drifting between the lanes and the sensors know it. And some of you are going, the cars do that? Yeah, they do. It's irritating at best. Um, <laughs> but we want to spend a little bit of time talking about drift. And we're going to talk about uh, how some things, undercurrents today, move us away from God's intended. And then over the next weeks, we're going to identify some of the truths that God puts out there and how some of these undercurrents try and pull us away from those truths. And we're trusting that the Holy Spirit reveals some lies, some things we've agreed with, and just reminds us of things because when you're attentive and when you're paying attention and when you're using your positioning system, which would be our Bibles, and what God has to say, it corrects the drift. It gets us back on course. Sound like fun? The title of today's sermon is called Undercurrents. I have this common question I get lots as I talk to people, and I ask it a ton, to be honest. How did we get here? When's the last time you asked that? I mean, have you been out and about, and uh, you're driving along, and you see somebody with a bumper sticker or a sign that you think 10 years ago nobody would have put up with that? How do we get here? You're with a group of people and, and there's others talking. And the language that they're using and what's happens, it, it just kind of startles you. you know, how did we get here? When did this become acceptable? You start listening to your coworkers talk and you start having visits with your neighbors and there's this normalization of ideas and practices where like, oh yeah, that, that's how we do things. You're like, how, how did we get here? What happened? Increasingly, I'm seeing as people exercise their individualism and their freedom, I, I'm asking the question, how did we get here with the massive amount of despair and unhappiness? More and more, we see people whose expectations of life are not meeting their reality And that peace in the middle is disappointment. And with their disappointment, with what they, it didn't meet my expectations, and and we're just seeing this despair. I mean, practically, I I have young people saying there's no hope for the future. They believe that the world's kind of ruined and and that economies aren't going to give them their opportunity, and why try? And I got to get mine now. And you will go, how do we get here? when God obviously has a wonderful plan 
and there's all kinds of opportunity. And he knew the age we'd be in, and he said everything we need. How do we get here with a loss of trust in our institutions and our leaders that's pervading? Oh, sure, some of them don't deserve our trust. Some of them have made big mistakes. But we've taken to tearing it down and chucking rocks. How do we get here? Is this what's going to be good for us? When God talks about life that flourishes and life that's abundant, is that the road? I mean, I can't be the only one having conversations with people outside the doors of this place where they've pursued everything that's interested them and they're incredibly unfulfilled. This is a hole in their heart. With increased selfishness has come the lack of ability to put anybody ahead of myself or serve something bigger than me. And it's brought on a despair. Or how about this? One of my big how did we get here for me has to do with planned dying and the sanctity of life. Where did we get to the point where we thought we knew best? And the encouragement is to choose the escape as they see it. It doesn't just happen with culture. It looks like I'm being kind of heavy. Let's get back to the personal. Let's bring it into our lives. You can smile. It's okay. Personally, I ask this question, how do we get here when I look in the mirror? Anybody else? I used to have more hair. When did this go gray? That's not how I remember myself. I was just with my folks, and uh, we were looking at old pictures. We had their 60th. It was a great time. But you just go, where did the time go? You look at your little nieces and nephews that are big nieces and nephews, right? I'm watching you come in here, and I'm looking at some of the kids, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> how did we get here? Uh, you're huge. You're too cool to talk to me at the door anymore. I'm very sad. <laughs> Happens lots with relationships as people come in. So I don't know what happened. We've just drifted apart. Can't identify it. Not sure how we got here. I just don't feel connected. I just don't get the same feelings. That happens with relationship with God too. Man, he seems very distant. I don't know what happened. But if I was being real, not sure prayer works. Time is tough right now. And I ask the question, how do we get here? What did we stop doing? What did we lose track of? What lies did we agree with? What happened? Because if we can recover that, we can get back to it. Oh, man, you want to talk about personal life, just start thinking about what we normalize, right? In how we spend our time, what takes us, our, uh, how we spend our money, what pursuits are there in our lives. And, and if you really do an evaluation of it, you go, wow, yeah, I don't really know why I'm doing that. I'm not sure how I got here. Because it really doesn't fit who I claim to be or who I know I am. But it's my reality. How we do marriage, how we view that connection, how we do family. Do we eat together anymore? Do you have a meal? Do you talk to one another? Is everybody on their device? What have we normalized? Or how about this one? What we consume in media. You ever ask yourself, what would grandpa think if he saw this show? <laughs> I have, and it's not good. Drift. Yeah, it happens to all of us. It happens unintentionally. I mean, we're definitely affected by the culture we're in. And we're definitely affected by everything around us. So how do we spot the undercurrents? And then how do we start to identify truth and just do this 
check correctively. Have I been drifting? Is there some things that are headed me for a shipwreck? Because I'm telling you, you eventually drift into trouble. <laughs> and it's bad. Undercurrents that push us further from God's intended. God gave us this pattern for human flourishing. And yet, when we look at our lives and look around, we say, I'm not sure we are. He says he gives us an incredible purpose and identity where our burden is easy and our yoke is light and, and even in the midst of trials, we can find joy. And he outlines this abundant life that we're supposed to be having. And, and as you kind of re-identify those things, you go, yeah, there's been some drift. What are the currents that are pushing us that need to be identified? What's taking us off course? What leads to shipwreck and damage? See, the temptation in my life when I'm out there is just to say, am I the same distance away from those other boats on the same water? Not am I attached to the waypoints I need to be? So, I wanna talk about three undercurrents today and then in the next parts of the series, we're gonna identify different truths and how culture, self, and our enemy is trying to take us away from the truth and just give you the opportunity to set your GPS or your course correction or to see if the rumble strip strips are being activated by the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're, you, you're headed to danger and this could hurt. Sound like fun? Yes. Nobody's smiling. I'm not doing a good job of selling this series. People are like, well, I'm going next Sunday. I'm... <laughs> nah. Hey, let me give you, a... here's some things to look forward to. First Sunday in October, who knows Keith and Melanie Hansel from Niger? Used to be here, used to be a part of our church. They're going to be with us. First weekend of October. October 15th weekend, Darren and Monaco, Paulus Chuck. Work with your hands, Cambodia. They're going to be here. And then uh, here's a blast from the past. Anybody remember Ray Perry? Yeah. <laughs> See it? So you, mark the first weekend of November down. You can miss. Ray will be here. No. <laughs> It'll be awesome. Three undercurrents. Um, if some of you have read this book... You're going to go, uh, Bob, that's not original. It's true, it's not. In fact, Dallas Willard had most of this first. And uh, John Mark Comer is the author. And it's called Live No Lies. And many of the things I'm talking about uh, come out of some of his work. They're out, out of scripture. He just organizes them well. And he talks about spiritual practices that go along with it. I highly recommend it. Fantastic read. If you're confused at the end of the message, he does a much better job than I do. There you go. First undercurrent. This one's obvious, right? This one you see, it's kind of like, um, I was watching a news report and there's this really popular beach in Florida and they said, like, we're having riptides. People are dying. And, and they were showing you how it worked and it was just obvious. It was right there. This is so for you that grew up in the church, this one's going to be obvious. We have an enemy. So first thing, trying to push you away from God's intended, acknowledge this right off the bat. We have an enemy. First Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So the picture in Scripture... Uh, is actually a pretty scary one. And we're not just talking about bad vibes. It says there is an enemy and he organizes a legion and he has a goal in mind. There is a devil. Scripture is really clear. He calls them the prince of this world. In John 8, 44, it says this, you are of your father, the devil, and, you will, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. 
because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Now notice what it says, he's a murderer. He desires to destroy everything. And, and not just keep something from you, not just you know, put you to sleep. He, he desires your destruction. He wants you to one day stand before God and give an account of how you don't measure up to God's holiness and pay your own price for your sin. He wants you to live without that purpose and without that healing and without that relationship. He wants to take that all away. He wants you to be destroyed. And he's at work trying to actively destroy societies and fool people. It says there's no truth in him. He's the father of all lies. And I want you to know that what he's selling has no good outcome, no fruit, no truth in it. Not a big point, but it's an important one. We have an enemy that's trying to push us off path. His goal coming out of John 10.10 The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Don't forget this enemy wants to steal from you, wants to kill you, wants to leave destruction. And his method is deceit, lies, accusation, and condemnation. He seems to be a master at setting a trap selling you a lie, having you go down a road, and when you've royally messed it up, when you know that what you've done is a poor choice, uh, what he wants to come along and do is reaffirm how terrible you are and how unworthy you are. Be, you know, in Revelation, it calls him the master accuser of the people of God, and, they, and condemn you and have you live in that mess. The good news The Bible's pretty clear. Jesus has defeated his power. There's freedom in Christ. He's coming back to rule and reign. We don't have to worry about this, but we do have to be aware. Now, I'm reminded of the story in the Old Testament when they come back and they're rebuilding the wall and they have enemies trying to uh, stop them from doing what they're doing. And so they get together and they say, we're gonna put a watchman on the wall and he's gonna look out. And as long as the enemy knows we're watching, He's not going to trick us and deceive us and get in. Scripture is just filled with this language of being aware, being on guard, being vigilant, keeping an eye out. And the Bible is clear, you have an enemy. So one of the undercurrents trying to push you away, trying to take you away, is an enemy who actively is trying to lie to you. He's asking the questions that he asked Eve. Did God really say that? Are you sure he knows what he's talking about? Maybe he's just trying to keep something from you. He's trying to get you to a path of destruction. Undercurrent number one, we have an enemy. You're like, oh, that's pretty basic, Bob. It all is. It's in scripture. It'll be there. Undercurrent number two, our culture. In 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, it says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. He says there's some things that uh, we're going to face in our culture that apart from God, you know, talk about the prince of this world, uh, that apart from God promises all kinds of things but doesn't deliver. And so the desires of the flesh, well, we can all relate to that. You know, we have cravings, right? And so God gave us an appetite. It's not bad to eat food, but how many of you are like me that it's not enough to eat a healthy supper and relax, then you get a craving that you must meet, right? 
Where's that bin with the chocolate in it? Ooh, salty. Mmm, chips. Who, who else can I get? Oh, that leftover steak. It's in the fridge. I'm trying to think of all the things that are going to make you hungry right now. <laughs> but we go to the things that aren't good for us, right? We have desires of the flesh that we want to meet and fulfill and that we, we have trouble practicing self-control over sometimes. Desires of the eyes. I would put covetousness here for me. Um, man, it's hard not to like some of the new stuff that's out there. Not that it's necessarily wrong, but when you're focused on new things or more this or if that, what someone else has, and not focused on Christ, you have a disordered desire. And the pride of life. How, I have rarely seen as much rebellion, ego, and arrogance in my days on the earth as I see out there today. The fact that we would just believe that we had the right to rebel against everything, that we deserve everything. I mean, it, it's right there. Satan just keeps feeding those lies. And it says the world won't last. It's all passing away. As we talk about our culture, I have to go to John 15, verses 18 to 20, where Jesus says this. If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Now, I believe Chris, last, where is Chris? He's here, so there he is. I believe you talked about this idea of hated last week. Did you cover that a little bit? I'll just, okay. I'll just throw it out. Um, we like to, in our cultural term, think of this great animosity towards, and I think if you unpack this, it would be rejected or didn't want it, and it's not necessarily this personal hating that goes on. Uh, so don't get hung up on that. But it's saying something really, really important. When it comes to our culture, when it comes to the values of the world, you don't belong and you won't be accepted because Jesus didn't belong and he wasn't accepted. Okay? So this expectation that we're in sort of a Christian culture or that our values will align or that we can be somewhat invisible, somewhat unseen, that we kind of take pride in the fact that nobody I work with knows I'm a Christian or knows I go to church, so I must be doing a great job at being tolerant, and, and don't hear me wrong, tolerance is really important, but your values aren't gonna align with theirs. Jesus said it clearly. And he says, don't take it personally, it, it comes right from me. I took you out of the world, you're part of me. He said, you're citizens of another kingdom. Now I've preached whole messages on this, so I don't wanna take a ton of time, but if you went to Ephesians 2 or James 2, I like what it says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to have your citizenship somewhere? Well. I've traveled a little bit and you go to another country and you get your passport out and they hopefully accept it, <laughs> stamp it, and you go in. And there's some conditions around how long you can stay and how long you can be there. And, and the way they do things and their rules, their laws, you're supposed to figure out like what side of the road you're supposed to drive on, like what licenses you need to do what, like what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. Here's a weird one in Thailand don't ever say something bad about the king. They can actually arrest you and throw you in jail. Uh, you don't have the same personal rights there as you have here. If they arrest you and throw you in jail, you need somebody to come and bring you food and look after you because they're not gonna, right? 
Just a whole different way of doing things. But when you're there, you've got your Canadian citizenship and your, your passport, and you hope that if you get into trouble, you have somebody behind you and they would recognize it. But you just know that you're not from there and you're not a part of that. And as much as you enjoy exploring or figuring it out or wondering why they do it, you are a citizen of a different place. The Bible uses terms like aliens. That you belong to the kingdom of God. He's placed you here for this temporal period of time in your life. But you're an alien. Do you ever feel like an alien out there? I have. It's like, man, are my beliefs that archaic? Have I just been brainwashed? Am I, I mean, I need to get back to the word and figure out if, if this is what God wants and what God intends and how it's going to work out. Calls us ambassadors, that we're supposed to be seen as representatives. He sends us in not only to bless the place he's planted us, but to represent him in it. An ambassador isn't very quiet, and what he's doing is seen and how he lives and talks is observed and recognized. What you need to know about our culture is this kingdom of the world and our kingdom, they're opposed. And we exist in what I call a hostile environment. Now, it didn't always be like that. I think there are periods of time in history and in different nations where uh, a nation honored God or recognized God Uh, We would be staggered at the statistics of the percentage of people who would claim faith. The nuns are growing faster than anything. I meet with people who don't know the Christmas story, don't know the Easter story. All they know about church is it's a place of condemnation and a place of judgment or weird people go there. I would give them that one. (laughs) Okay, you got me there. We're all pretty messed up. Hypocrites, yep, that's us. Um... Not on purpose, we just, we're trying, we're all figuring it out. But our culture has opposing values to ours in an increasingly developing way. We are now seen as part of the problem, not the solution to the problem. When we espouse identity and values, and we say there is right and wrong, that God has a design, when it flies in the face of what our culture is saying, uh, they're hostile. They don't see it as helpful. And so you just need to know that we are in a hostile environment. And if your expectation, if you're just waking up and going, what happened? Our culture has drifted far from God. Our culture has moved radically in the other direction. So we're citizens of this other kingdom, aliens living in a land, we're ambassadors, we're we're representatives, we're supposed to be a light. And so our worldview and our value system and our practices and our norms, they're supposed to be seen, they're supposed to be understood, but they are at sharp odds with those of our host culture. Our host culture is busy redefining good and evil and choosing it indiscriminately. There's an abandonment of truth as being anything other than what we decide, and of standards being what works for us in a time and a place. The view of the sanctity of life is completely shattered, and we've taken it into our own hands. So I call this post-Christian. Make no mistake, one of the undercurrents you have you face that causes drift as you live in a post-Christian environment. Let me give you a quote. Mark Sayer, one of the, I don't know if you listen to Rebuilders podcasts, Uh, the guy just has a, a view of the past and history and what's going on in nations and how it fits. Um, Yeah, if you're a podcaster, I recommend it. Here's a quote from one of his books. Post-Christianity is not pre-Christianity. Rather, post-Christianity attempts to move beyond Christianity while simultaneously feasting on its fruit. Post-Christian culture attempts to retain the solace of faith while gutting it of the costs 
commitments and restraints that the gospel places upon the individual will. Post-Christian, Christianity intuitively yearns for the justice and shalom of the kingdom while defending the reign of the individual. While we have an enemy, we need to be on guard. He's active, and his goal is destruction. His methods, lying, accusing, deceiving, condemning. And Jesus has given us everything we need to deal with that. But we need to recognize we live in a culture that's hostile to ours. We're not from here. We're citizens of another kingdom. If you have a relationship with Christ, you belong to him. He says, I've taken you out of that and into this. And then scripture talks about taking off those old clothes and putting on the new ones and, and living up to who you already are in Christ. But we have one more undercurrent to talk about before we get to the so what. Our hearts, the flesh. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You know, the words of the hymn writer have resounded with me over the years. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Anybody else have the tyranny of the urgent take them from doing what they know they needed to do? Anybody else, when life was going well, stopped dealing with the desires of this only to go, how did I get here? Galatians 5 says this, I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now. Our hearts are an interesting thing. To keep you from doing what you were supposed to do. Jesus has said, I've come that you've had freedom from that. I've come to set you free from all that obligation and slavery that comes, that being addicted and trapped. But it says, you were called to freedom, brothers, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh to serve yourself, but love and serve one another. Now let's acknowledge that the heart has desires. They're not all bad, but here's some things I hear lots from people. Let's see if you've heard any of them. Follow your heart. Anybody? Heard that one? <laughs> it's a half truth. If your heart is set on Christ, but if your heart is wicked and you believe some lies and you follow your heart, you could be headed over the edge of a cliff. Uh, how about this one? You do you. Eh? Ultimate tolerance there. Of course, the lie is that your actions don't affect anybody else, that somehow you're disconnected, that you're just an individual. And God says you're part of the body. All the parts of the body affect each other. He says, I just can't imagine you saying that to your kids. You do you. <laughs> As long as you do what I tell you to do, you can do you. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. yeah. Here's another one. Speak your truth. Ooh. Well, Bob, what, what, what's wrong with that? Well, what if your truth is an utter lie? What if, you're just, what if you've been deceived? How about speaking God's truth? How about standing on what he said? How about going, well, all the evidence is I believe that guy. And he... The grave's empty. He's coming back. That's where I'm going. What about this one? Be true to yourself. Well, is that every day? Because I was pretty grumpy yesterday. 
I had some choice words I could have told somebody. Should I have been true to myself then? You mean no self-control? No, no, I'm just talking about your desires, your longings. Oh, well, if they come from God, sure. But if your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, if the unregenerated heart is bent with a massive wheel alignment away from what's good for you, it's an undercurrent that takes you to a wreck. One more. No, I'm not going to. These half-truths, they lead to disaster. The heart has desires. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's this clear call when it comes to our flesh to be vigilant about the passions of our flesh, the desires of our body and mind. Scripture talks about dying to self, It talks about self-control being the fruit of the Spirit. We know from this passage that that was directed by the enemy for our destruction and that Jesus came to set us free, to not have us enslaved to these things. We don't have to go down this road, but we are called to die to this, to put those things off. And you see the prayer of Jesus for his disciples in John 17. I don't pray that you take them out of this world, but keep them as their aliens as they live by different values, as they will be hated or opposed by the values of this culture, they'll be seen as hurtful, not helpful. The good news, I can't finish this part without saying, hey, there's there's great news here. Let's read verses four to eight. I just couldn't leave them out. But God, being rich in mercy... Right? Mercy means you stood condemned justly. You got pulled over, you were speeding. Yes, I was speeding. If he's merciful, he doesn't give you a ticket. Right? God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Time's up. Let's ask a question. So what? Uh, First, drift is incredibly dangerous. I got to preach the parable of the soils a few weeks ago. And just reminded me so much that... There's hard-packed soil, and there's soil that it springs up and dies, right? But the one that's the most scary is the soil where there's all kinds of other things planted alongside it, and you see lots of green and lots of growth, but there's no fruit. And when you really look into it, you find out that the, the gardener will cut those things that don't produce fruit out and throw them away to be burned, right? Drift is incredibly dangerous. You don't want other things to grow up in your life. You don't want lies to come and take you off track. There is destruction around the corner. It's so important to have a fixed point of reference. And if you say, I believe that the word of God is true and that we can stand on it, that the grave is empty, we have a fixed point of reference. He said, for human flourishing, I'm going to give you everything that you need. And then I'm going to give you each other to struggle along and try and figure it out. And there's this key that I give you my spirit. And he's there to uh, show you when things are going to harm you and have you bring you to repentance and confession. And, but the, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. It's not a guilt thing and it's not a condemnation thing. It's a restora- restoration. It's a renewal in relationship. 
And this walking in the spirit, all of a sudden the things that used to attract me and used to draw me and used to addict me begin to fall away as I exercise spiritual practices, as I allow God to do it in me. The question is, are you willing in this season from now till end of November-ish, unless we do what we always do and just pick the series up again in January if we're having fun? I'm, I'm kidding. We just have done that way too often. Are you willing to ask this question? Are you willing to gaze into scripture for some truths? To allow the Holy Spirit to use the rumble strips and point out potential drift in your belief systems and your practices? It's a genuine question because some of you will say, no, I'm pretty happy in my rebellion, I'm good. I like feeling somewhat safe, but I don't want to give up these things I put my hand around. And God is saying that's the enemy and his lies. He's keeping you from flourishing. I have more for you. Second, I want you to know drift is subtle. It, it's just hard to notice, right? It's kind of like that kid that's in your house every day and then all of a sudden he stands at the door frame beside that mark that you made six months ago and you go, whoa. What happened? You're like six inches taller. Drift is one of those things where we wake up and ask the question, how did we get here? And what I don't want you to do is come away from this series with guilt-inducing condemnation. That's from the enemy. I want this to be an invitation for course correction. To go, wow, that snuck in. I didn't see that. Am I ever glad God opened my eyes? Am I ever glad he, he showed me? Am I ever glad the rumble strips woke me up or the, the lane assist told me I was wandering? But don't believe this lie that this is just about you. I want you to be, be really clear. Drift is subtle, but it affects everyone around you. Let me flesh this out for you for a minute. Many of you have loved ones in your home, kids who are watching. You're downloading the example of how to do it. You have people in your life who need your leadership and example. They need some kind of an anchor against all of the same undercurrents that are pushing their boats around. You're here so all of you in this room have fellow believers. The Bible tells us that we're a body and that he gifts the body for the building up of one another, that we're to serve one another. He gives all these different gifts to everybody. There's other believers who need your gifts, need your investment, need your service. And perhaps the drift has been subtle but has been my life has become about me and consuming. And this whole putting God at the top of my time and money. No, no, it's just become one more thing that I've worked into my life when it's convenient. And finally, all of you have lost people around you that are in desperate need of hope and truth. They are longing to find somewhere to anchor their boat that gives them identity and purpose and meaning and eternal hope. Drift is subtle. Are you willing to let God use you? And finally, as encouragement, realignment is spirit-empowered. This is where I think in my past... Um, I gotta choose my words carefully. We, we agree to this point and then in, a, in an attempt to make it practical, we go, so let's change all these behaviors or I come out of here with a list of things I've gotta do better and there are spiritual practices and there is behavioral change, it's, it's half true. But God said, 
This is spirit empowered. Re- realignment is, is this reconnection with the Holy Spirit of God. This is something he does in and through you. This is actually exciting. And if you come in today and say, you can't give me one more to-do list. I've tried six times to do all the things and I failed. I tried to be like those people I idolized and I'll never be them. I must be left out or I must be different or, or maybe God just didn't make me like that or maybe I'm, you know. I want you to, I want you to know we, we love you. We really believe in you. And he says, everything you need has been provided for you. This is a partnering with the Holy Spirit. Will it take some work on your part? Yeah, sure it will. But is it another list to go out of here and try and suck up the courage to do? No, it's not. This is a reconnection with the living God who called you out of this world, who gave you this inheritance, and who has an incredible purpose for your life. Let me pray. Father in heaven, take away everything that's just Bob. What you have for our people from your word, would it not be lost? And Father, I just pray over the Sundays to come. We just invite you, Holy Spirit, to show up, to unpack the word for us. And Lord, would we be people who ever more vibrantly live and walk with you, love and serve one another, and deeply, deeply affect our community as we've been called to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.